Another fun amino acid I want to show you is this one. It's cysteine. Um, so it has a sulfur here and a hydrogen there. In isolation, that is nothing special at all. Uh, but if, what happens if I take two of them? Yellow is a good color for this. So if I have this chain, chain here, and then I have a cysteine here, that sulfur would normally have a hydrogen, but I'm deliberately not drawing that one now. I'm having a second chain here that also has an AC. What can happen is that this can for, they can form a bond. Um, and this means that the entire chain on the left here is now bound with a covalent bond on the chain to the right. Whether this happens or not depends if I'm oxidizing or reducing this whole reaction. Uh, but if I, under normal conditions, if I have two cysteines very close to each other, this type of bond typically will form um, if they're within a few, well, eight angstroms or so, the, the sulfurs. Do you see that this is creating a very strong global constraint? There's completely different chains of the protein, and once I brought them together, they now form this bond. This turns out to be what happened to Christian Amfensen when those ribonuclease formed incorrect structures. So in the correct structures, we had, would have these so-called disulfide bridges. Disulfide bridge formed in the right place. But when he denaturated them, they like to form pairs. So the structure that was in just a big blobby chain, they formed disulfide bridges in the wrong place. And then we need some help to break those. And that is broken by a small protein called protein disulfide isomerase. So that would go in, break these bonds, and then give the protein a second chance to form them again. Do you see how I've drawn this with many chains? I told you in one of the initial lectures, might have been lecture one, that it's rare to use NMR spectroscopy to determine structures. But for these small structures, NMR can actually work quite well. So this is an NMR structure, and it's cool, no pun intended, because it's a structure that we don't have at 100 Kelvin, but in room temperature in solvent. And that's typical that we see a bit of the motion when we have this entire ensemble of structures. So these disulfide bridges can really help stabilize structures that are otherwise a bit chaotic, which are going to be useful in some cases. Let me show you. So this might initially look like a piece of an unfolded structure. It's just a random coil, but trust me, it's not. Let me show you that in slightly more detail. What if I show you all the side chains too? No, it doesn't make more sense. It's just still just a random blob of things. But what if I show you the cysteine residues? Do you see them in yellow here, here, and there was something in there? So there are at least three places where this molecule has formed these disulfide bridges. So at first sight, it might look like a piece of yarn randomly thrown on the floor. But because of these three disulfide bridges, this ends up being a very rigid structure, although it doesn't really have any normal secondary structure. So this is a stable protein, the structure which we've been able to determine. Uh, this particular one is called HANA toxin, and there's actually a fun story about that. The Kenton Schwartz, working with voltage-gated channels, uh, his daughter was called Hannah, uh, so he named this particular toxin when they discovered it after her. Uh, I have no idea what his wife said, but I remember Kento saying at one conference that, you know, when, when she was a child and everything, it was a bit awkward. But when you're a 20-year-old, it's pretty cool to have a toxin named after you. Hana toxin is special that if you are, say, a spider or some other organisms and you want to be able to inject a protein in your prey, it is actually very convenient to have something that is super stable and it's difficult for the prey to break down or defend against. So it makes a lot of sense that for toxins you want to have things that are small and very, very hard to unfold.